Welcome back to Classic Stories and Fairy Tales. I'm your host and narrator, Jerry Coble, and we are reading The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Today, we are reading Chapter 2, Slavery and Escape. That evil influence which carried me first away from my father's house, which hurried me into the wild and indigested notion of raising my fortune, and that impressed those conceits so forcibly upon me as to make me deaf to all good advice and to the entreaties and even the commands of my father, I say, the same influence, whatever it was, presented the most unfortunate of all enterprises to my view, and I went on board a vessel bound to the coast of Africa, or, as our sailors vulgarly called it, a voyage to Guinea. It was my great misfortune that in all these adventures I did not ship myself as a sailor, when, though I might indeed have worked a little harder than ordinary, yet at the same time I should have learnt the duty and office of a foremast man, and in time might have qualified myself for a mate or lieutenant, if not for a master. But as it was always my fate to choose for the worse, so I did here. For having money in my pocket and good clothes upon my back, I would always go on board in the habit of a gentleman, and so I neither had any business in the ship nor learned to do any. It was my lot, first of all, to fall into pretty good company in London, which does not always happen to such loose and misguided young fellows as I then was the devil generally not omitting to lay some snare for them very early, but it was not so with me. I first got acquainted with the master of a ship who had been on the coast of Guinea, and who, having had very good success there, was resolved to go again. This captain, taking a fancy to my conversation, which was not at all disagreeable at the time, hearing me say I had a mind to see the world, told me if I would go the voyage with him, I should be at no expense. I should be his messmate and his companion, and if I could carry anything with me, I should have all the advantage of it that the trade would admit, and perhaps I might meet with some encouragement. I embraced the offer, and entering into a strict friendship with this captain, who was an honest, plain-dealing man, I went the voyage with him and carried a small adventure with me, which, by the disinterested honesty of my friend the captain, I increased very considerably, for I carried about forty pounds in such toys and trifles as the captain directed me to buy. These forty pounds I had mustered together by the assistance of some of my relations whom I corresponded with, and who, I believe, got my father, or at least my mother, to contribute so much as that to my first adventure. This was the only voyage which I may say was successful in all my adventures, which I owe to the integrity and honesty of my friend the captain, under whom also I got a competent knowledge of the mathematics and the rules of navigation, learned how to keep an account of the ship's course, take an observation, and, in short, to understand some things that were needful to be understood by a sailor. For as he took delight to instruct me, I took delight to learn, and, in a word, This voyage made me both a sailor and a merchant, for I brought home five pounds nine ounces of gold dust for my adventure, which yielded me in London, at my return, almost three hundred pounds, and this filled me with those aspiring thoughts which have since so completed my ruin. Yet, even in this voyage, I had my misfortunes too, particularly that I was continually sick, being thrown into a violent calenture by the excessive heat of the climate, our principal trading being upon the coast, from latitude of 15 degrees north even to the line itself. I was now set up for a guinea trader, and my friend, to my great misfortune, dying soon after his arrival, I resolved to go the same voyage again, and I embarked in the same vessel with one who was his mate in the former voyage, and I had now got the command of the ship. This was the unhappiest voyage that ever man made, for though I did not carry quite one hundred pounds of my new gained wealth, so that I had two hundred pounds left, which I had lodged with my friend's widow, who was very just to me, yet I fell into terrible misfortunes. The first was this. Our ship making her course towards the Canary Islands, 
or rather between those islands and the African shore, was surprised in the gray of the morning by a Turkish rover of Saul, who gave chase to us with all the sail she could make. We crowded also as much canvas as our yards would spread, or our mast carry, to get clear, but finding the pirate gained upon us, and would certainly come up with us in a few hours, we prepared to fight, our ship having twelve guns and the rogue eighteen. About three in the afternoon he came up with us, and bringing to, by mistake, just athwart our quarter, instead of athwart our stern, as he intended. We brought eight of our guns to bear on that side, and poured in a broadside upon him, which made him sheer off again, after returning our fire, and pouring in also his small shot from near two hundred men which he had on board. However, we had not a man touched, all our men keeping close. He prepared to attack us again, and we to defend ourselves, but laying us on board the next time upon our other quarter, he entered sixty men upon our decks, who immediately fell to cutting and hacking the sails and rigging. We plied them with small shot, half pikes, powder chest, and such like, and cleared our deck of them twice. However, to cut short this melancholy part of our story, our ship being disabled, and three of our men killed, and eight wounded, we were obliged to yield, and were carried all prisoners into Saul, a port belonging to the Moors. The usage I had there was not so dreadful as I first apprehended, nor was I carried up the country to the emperor's court, as the rest of our men wore, but was kept by the captain of the rover as his proper prize, and made his slave, being young and nimble and fit for his business. At this surprising change of my circumstances, from a merchant to a miserable slave, I was perfectly overwhelmed, and now I look back upon my father's prophetic discourse to me, that I should be miserable and have none to relieve me, which I thought was now so effectually brought to pass that I could not be worse, for now the hand of heaven had overtaken me, and I was undone without redemption. But alas, this was but a taste of the misery I was to go through, as will appear in the sequel of this story. As my new patron or master had taken me home to his house, so I was in hopes that he would take me with him when he went to sea again believing that it would some time or other be his fate to be taken by a Spanish or Portugal man-of-war, and that then I should be set at liberty. But this hope of mine was soon taken away, for when he went to sea, he left me on shore to look after his little garden and do the common drudgery of slaves about his house. And when he came home again from his cruise, he ordered me to lie in the cabin to look after the ship. Here I meditated nothing but my escape, and what method I might take to effect it, but found no way that had the least probability in it, nothing presented to make the supposition of it rational, for I had nobody to communicate it to that would embark with me, no fellow slave, no Englishman, Irishman, or Scotchman there but myself, so that for two years, though I often pleased myself with imagination, yet I never had the least encouraging prospect of putting it in practice. After about two years, an odd circumstance presented itself which put the old thought of making some attempt for my liberty again in my head. My patron lying at home longer than usual without fitting out his ship, which, as I heard, was for want of money, he used constantly once or twice a week, sometimes oftener if the weather was fair, to take the ship's pinnacle and go out into the road of fishing. And as he always took me and young Marisco with him to row the boat, we made him very merry, and I proved very dexterous in catching fish, and so much that sometimes he would send me with a moor, one of his kinsmen, and the youth, the Marisco, as they called him, to catch a dish of fish for him. It happened one time that going of fishing in a calm morning, a fog rose so thick that, though we were not half a league from the shore, we lost sight of it, and rowing we knew not whither or which way. We labored all day and all the next night, and when the morning came, we found we had pulled off to sea instead of pulling in for the shore, 
and that we were at least two leagues from the shore. However, we got well in again, though with a great deal of labor and some danger, for the wind began to blow pretty fresh in the morning, but we were all very hungry. But our patron, warned by this disaster, resolved to take more care of himself for the future, and, having lying by him the long boat of our English ship that he had taken, he resolved he would not go a-fishing any more without a compass and some provision. So he ordered the carpenter of his ship, who was an English slave, to build a little stateroom, or cabin, in the middle of the longboat, like that of a barge, with a place to stand behind it to steer, and haul home the main sheet. The room before, for a hand or two to stand and work the cells. She sailed with what we called a shoulder of mutton cell, and the boom jibed over the top of the cabin, which lay very snug and low, and had in it room for him to lie, with a slave or two, and a table to eat on, with some small lockers to put in some bottles of such liquor as he thought it fit to drink, and his bread, rice, and coffee. We went frequently out with this boat of fishing, and as I was most dexterous to catch fish for him, he never went without me. It happened that he had appointed to go out into this boat, either for pleasure or for fish, with two or three moors of some distinction in that place, and for whom he had provided extraordinarily, and had, therefore, sent on board the boat overnight a large store of provisions than ordinary, and had ordered me to get ready three fussies with powder and shot, which were on board his ship, for that they designed some sport of fowling as well as fishing. I got all things ready as he had directed, and waited the next morning with the boat washed clean, her ancient and pendants out, and everything to accommodate his guest, when, by and by, my patron came on board alone, and told me his guest had put off going from some business that fell out, and ordered me, with the man and boy, as usual, to go out with the boat and catch them some fish, for that his friends were to sup at his house, and commanded that as soon as I got some fish, I should bring it home to his house, all which I prepared to do. This moment my former notions of deliverance darted into my thoughts, for now I found I was likely to have a little ship at my command, and my master being gone, I prepared to furnish myself not for fishing business, but for a voyage, though I knew not, neither did I so much as consider whether I should steer. Anywhere to get out of that place was my desire. My first contrivance was to make a pretense to speak to this moor, to get something for our subsistence on board, for I told him we must not presume to eat our patron's bread. He said that was true, so he brought a large basket of rusk or biscuit, and three jars of fresh water into the boat. I knew where my patron's cases of bottles stood, which it was evident, by the make, were taken out of some English prize, and I conveyed them into the boat while the moor was on shore, as if they had been there for our master. I conveyed also a great lump of beeswax into the boat, which weighed about half a hundred weight, with a parcel of twine or thread, a hatchet, a saw, and a hammer, all of which were of great use to us afterwards, especially the wax to make candles. Another trick I tried upon him, which he innocently came into also, his name was Ismail, which they called Muley, or Moly. So I called to him, Moly. Moly, said I, our patron's guns are on board the boat. Can you not get a little powder and shot? It may be we may kill some alchemies, a fowl like our curlews, for ourselves, for I know he keeps the gunner store in his ship. Yes, says he, I'll bring some. And accordingly, he brought a great leather pouch which held a pound and a half of powder, or rather more. And another was shot that had five or six pounds with some bullets and put all into the boat. At the same time, I found some powder of my master's in the great cabin, with which I filled one of the large bottles in the case, which was almost empty, pouring what was in it into another, and thus furnished with everything needful, we sailed out of the port to fish. The castle, which is at the entrance of the port, knew who we were, and took no notice of us, and we were not above a mile out of port before we hauled in our cell and set us down to fish. 
The wind blew from the north-northeast, which was contrary to my 